some of the things that we're doing here at Sylvester Cancer Center really to work towards finding a cure for patients with GIST. And so I'm going to go over a few things and you know largely here at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center as Dr. Livingstone mentioned for GIST we work as a multidisciplinary team and Whatever rare disease you have, wherever you go, it's critical that you have a multidisciplinary team on your side to help with all aspects of your care. And this, these are representative members of our GIST team, many of whom you've met today. And at Sylvester, we have, we have core values and a core mission and it for all types of cancer. Specifically GIST we're talking about today, how are we going to improve patient care? How are we going to one day get a cure? And really, you, we think of it in these four broad categories. What can we do in terms of education, prevention, direct patient care, and research for the future? So in education, it's not just patient education events like this. Community oncologists, nurses, nurse practitioners, Everybody that, that touches a GIST patient in their care can benefit from education. Dr. Wilkie, myself, Livingstone, Lisa, we're continually learning new things about GIST. And that's the way you improve care and that's the only way we're gonna get, get to, a, to a cure. So there's, Lisa's already gone over a list of websites, namely Life Raft Group, GIST Support International as well. Um, for more information about GIST, about what these organ important organizations are doing for GIST patients. There's also patient education conferences like the one we're having today. The Life Raft Group is sponsoring several around the country. This is not the only one. This, uh, the the uh, GIST Support International also supports a patient, a patient education conference. The, uh, you may have seen out front, there's a GIST cancer journal. This is largely targeting clinicians and nurses, but it's, it's also, there's information in there that's useful for patients and their caregivers. Continuing medical and nursing education is important. There's a number of events around the country, here in Florida and South Florida, that specifically have the goal of educating the healthcare community about GIST. And there's medical conferences that we go to. Once or twice a year we go to these conferences and discuss, discuss uh, our approach to GIST, our latest research. We hear what other GIST centers are doing in terms of their approach to patient care, in terms of their, their research, in terms of their educational initiatives. Did you have a question? I did. Just a yeah. Yeah, so there's a number of things. You know, there's a number of things that you can do. You can communicate with other, other GIST patients in the GIST community through social media, through Life Raft Group. You can also volunteer. So, Sylvester Cancer Center also has a number of volunteers. We have a whole Department of Volunteer Services. If that. No, the, the biggest problem, you know, the biggest problem that we face, and we face this all the time, is interacting with a patient after a, a, what we would consider a standard medical approach was not, not performed by somebody who's not experienced in GIST. So we, you know, we just want to be involved at the very beginning at the time of diagnosis or even before diagnosis. Yep, 
Okay, so education's critical, and these, these are all, all important initiatives. Um, continuing medicational nursing events, the big conferences that we go to, and, uh, and, and those really help educate not just the clinicians, but also the, the um, patients, their caregivers, nurses. Now I'll say a little bit about prevention. I'm not gonna say much because there's very little known about GIST. We know, as you've seen today from the previous speakers, it's pretty clear that mutations in genes like KIT, PDGF receptor, loss of SDH, these are all risk factors that cause that interstitial cell of Cajal to turn into a GIST cell. But what causes those mutations? What causes that initial KIT mutation? Is it a random event that just is gonna happen? Or is there something in the environment? Or is there some type of genetic predisposition? There's a little bit of work going on in the areas of genetic predisposition, but not very much. And there's almost nothing that's going on in terms of environmental risk factors. This is an area where research, research is needed. So, what puts somebody at higher risk than the general population for just one of those those events would be a what would be considered a hereditary just syndrome and there's largely three hereditary just syndromes that are well known i have to point out these are exceptionally rare 99.9 .9 of just patients have what we call sporadic just meaning it's not hereditary it's not related in their family but there are a few cases where GIST is hereditary. One is so-called familial GIST. In familial GIST, this is due to a mutation in the germline. In other words, every single cell in the person's body has a mutation in KIT or PDGF receptor. Those are the two, two major, major known forms. Um, these are very rare and they're very apparent when they're in a family. I have two families that I follow that have this and in and it's very apparent when it happens because there are many members in the family with just for instance one of the families has 15 members of the family that all have GI stromal tumor so that's very clear if you don't have that type of pattern then you don't have familial just so I'm not trying to scare anybody it's very rare but it can happen there's also a syndrome called Carney Stratakis syndrome. And this, in this syndrome, it's caused by loss of a gene called SDH. And again, it's in the germline, every single cell in the body. People who are affected are younger, often women. And these are um, associated with a type of cancer called paraganglioma. So they're in the family again. There are these paragangliomas and gists that occur in the family, they're younger individuals. These are, this is a situation where children sometimes get gist. But again, it's usually fairly apparent because multiple people with gist in the family, multiple people with paragangliomas in the family. Then there's another syndrome, and, and, and then there's another syndrome called neurofibromatosis. Neurofibromatosis, Dr. Rosenberg mentioned briefly, it's also called von Recklinghausen disease. And patients uh, have, a, have loss of a gene called neurofibromin. They get little bumps on the nerves. And what happens is they do have some slight increase in, in the risk of GIST. This is in the range of 5% of patients with neurofibromatosis will get just so it's it's still fairly rare in that group these individuals with neurofibromatosis will have certain manifestations such as certain uh, hyperpigmented areas called cafe au lait spots on their skin they often have bumps hundreds if not thousands of bumps on their skin so it's also pretty apparent when somebody has this entity these are the syndromes in the whole world these are the only familial GIST syndromes that have been reported. So there's only a handful of maybe seven that have been reported to have a hereditary GIST. 
So let's shift gears to some areas where we have a little more information. Patient care, this core, core mission, core value at the Sylvester um, Sarcoma Center in our approach to patients with GIST. There are certain things that are standard of care that have been discussed by Dr. Wilkie, Dr. Livingstone. We also see a lot of GIST patients and realize that a lot of times you have to think outside the box. GIST is a rare disease. There's not a cookbook. There's not an algorithm that you follow. There's not a computer program that you type in the patient's specific situation and it tells you what to do. It's a lot of times putting complicated situations together, mutation, what the mutation is, the location, how many prior surgeries, how many prior treatments, the mitotic rate, the size of the tumor. We put all of this together and try to figure out what's the best approach for an individual patient. And a lot of times this takes thinking outside the box. So, so we'll be discussing today some of the things that at some places, they wouldn't even, some, some, some medical centers wouldn't even think about doing because it's not, not uh, necessarily in the algorithms or guidelines that are published. So we think about localized therapies. We put a lot of emphasis on mutation testing. We think every GIST patient should undergo mutation testing so that we can understand what type of GIST an individual patient has because there's not just one type of GIST. And uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it's something that we do and try to do for every single patient. The reality is in the United States, only about 10 to 15% of GIST patients get mutation testing at all, which is mind boggling to me why our healthcare system lets that happen. But that's just the reality. At our institution, it's over 90% of patients. I'll also talk a little bit about off-label therapy. So this is using a medication for, for a patient for which the FDA has not approved that medicine. And that's not always easy to do. It's complicated. It takes, takes some, uh, some creativity, figuring out what, what's the rationale that this new drug is going to help a patient. Sometimes it takes a lot of work on our social worker like Lisa Merheb can sometimes figure out how to make these things happen because it's, very, it's, it's not easy to do. These medications cost sometimes ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month, and if there's no FDA approval, we have to convince the insurance provider that it's the patient's, it's the best interest of the patient to take this medicine. And then I'll talk a little bit about generic imatinib, and at the end, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about that. So here's a patient with just in the liver. And I know you've seen a lot of CT scans today, but I'm just going to point out that these are dark lesions that have responded and are essentially dead. There's no blood flow going into these tumors. These are all dead. But then you've got this bright one. It's, got, it's full of blood vessels. The blood vessels are carrying the contrast into the tumor. And it's showing up bright on the CT. So this one is growing. So the patient has multiple lesions that are all responding to imatinib. The patient's benefiting from the majority of the lesions, but there's this one rogue lesion that's growing. Does it make sense to take the patient off of imatinib, switch to something else to treat this lesion? That would risk these starting to grow on the new treatment. So what we do in this situation is, is we work with our interventional radiologists in a procedure called hepatic arterial embolization. And what our interventional radiologists do is they basically do an angiogram in the liver, like one would for the heart to identify a blockage. Except in the liver, our interventional radiologists identify the specific blood vessel that's feeding the tumor. And then they shoot particles into that blood vessel that swell up and choke off the blood supply so that there's no blood going to that tumor anymore, and what you get now is a dead tumor. And you can continue on imatinib, or it could be sunitinib, or regorafenib, or whatever, to control these that are, are, were not growing before. So it's a way to use a localized therapy to control a limited form of progression. Now, if all of the tumors in the whole body were growing at the same time, you'd have to switch medications. But this is true, and, and when we looked at our data, 
you're able to control shrink tumors with this approach 65% of the time. Switching to a new medication, you shrink tumors or get a response like this often only 10 or 15% of the time. So, so this is a very good way to approach limited type progression. I mentioned embolization. Our interventional radiologists can also do radiofrequency ablation, can do uh, a, pro, uh, a type of approach called IRE or electroporation that uses electricity. They use sometimes liquid nitrogen to freeze the tumors. It just depends on the individual patient, the location of the tumor, and what is best for that patient. They all work equally well. We also, as you heard, work with Dr. Livingstone. Sometimes in the right situation, this patient could have this lesion resected. And if that's the only site that's growing, then when the patient recovers, we treat with imatinib to continue treating everything else in the patient's body. In certain situations, we also use radiation therapy. It's another localized approach. It's typically used to treat a primary tumor. Occasionally, we use it to treat metastases. Mo many, if not most, oncologists will tell you that there's no role for radiation therapy in GIST, but that's simply not the case. We've used it enough that we know in certain areas and certain locations when you can deliver a meaningful dose, radiation therapy is also a treatment option that's on the table for any patient in the right situation. So I'll say a little bit about our approach to mutation testing. We think mutation testing is critical for GIST patients because as I've been telling you, and as the other presenters mentioned, GIST is not one disease. It's a collection of different types of cancer. And so these are the different types of GIST based on the different types of mutation. And they're all a little bit different. They're not exactly the same. GIST looks similar under the microscope under um, light microscopy when the pathologist like, Dr. Living, like uh, Dr. Rosenberg looks at it. But when we molecularly characterize the tumors, we find that some have exon 11 mutation. We find that others have exon 9. It turns out that 800 milligram dose of imatinib seems to be more effective than 400 if the patient has a kid exon 9 mutation. We also find patients with SDHB deficiency. This is like the Carney Stratakis syndrome I mentioned. These patients can also get GIST. Seems like imatinib doesn't work very well, whereas regorafenib, sunitinib seem to have a better activity in SDHB deficient GIST. This may be due to the fact that loss of SDH leads to increased, uh, increased angiogenesis. Increased angiogenesis is a target of the uh, vascular growth factor inhibitors, like Dr. Wilkie mentioned, sunitinib, regorafenib. Some patients, I have a couple in my practice with RAF mutation. And the kit inhibitors like imatinib, sunitinib, regorafenib don't work against RAF very well, if at all. Different inhibitors such as vimurafenib work exceptionally well. So this patient, if you didn't know this patient had a RAF mutation, they would be treated with imatinib and it wouldn't work. Knowing that the patient has RAF mutation leads to the appropriate therapy with a RAF inhibitor. In F1 mutant GIST, we don't know what the best treatment is there. We typically may use a RAF inhibitor. Same with RAS mutant GIST. There's a subset of patients whose GIST has a mutation in a gene called PI3 kinase. There's inhibitors of this protein. When that mutation is present and the tumor is driven by that molecular event, imatinib or the kit inhibitors are not going to work. But an inhibitor that directly inhibits PI3 kinase or an mTOR inhibitor um, could work. Some GIST have IGF overexpression. There are clinical trials looking at these inhibitors. And then there are these resistance mutations. Some patients with GIST, their tumor will become resistant to a kinase such as imatinib and develop a secondary mutation. If the secondary mutation is exon 13, sunitinib seems to be a little more active, whereas if it's in Exxon 17, it may be a newer drug called panatinib that's in clinical trial that's more active against this mutation. So it's critical to get this type of testing done for any, any newly diagnosed GIST patient, particularly if you're considering therapy. 
So what do we do after the approved drugs? If patients had a matinib, sunitinib, regorafenib, there's a number of other nibs. There's so many nibs out there and there's so few just patients and many of them are coming off of, uh, off of their um, patent. So the trials will never be done. There may never be done a trial of serafinib and GIST, but serafinib does have some activity. It can shrink GIST in certain individuals. So does dasatinib, nilotinib, pazopinib, panatinib. These all have some activity in GIST patients, so they should be on the table if there's no other treatment choices. Of course, we always look at clinical trials, but these are off-label therapies. Sometimes we add mTOR inhibitor to a kinase inhibitor that may be working, but not working as quite as well as it used to, to give it a little boost. There's a number of immunotherapies. I know some patients around the country that are taking some of these newer immunotherapies that they're getting them off, they're not on protocol, not on clinical trials, they're getting them off-label. And so uh, we don't have any data yet, but we will. We will soon, and uh, with uh, Dr. Wilkie's clinical trial that I'll discuss in a little bit. Um, Placebo is generally not a good thing to take in GIST. It, it's necessary in some clinical trials, but we know from the sunitinib trial that patients' tumors start growing on a median of six weeks. We know that on the regorafenib trial, patients that were treated with placebo had tumors growing in less than four weeks. So we try to avoid coming off therapy, continuing some type of kit inhibitor is, is recommended. So we'll switch gears and talk a little about generics. So what is a generic? So a generic is a product that's it's essentially interchangeable. Chemically, structurally, it's identical to the branded originator compound. It's manufactured often with a license and it's after the expiration of date of the patent of the originator or the original medication. This is the World Health Organization's definition. Put that in context of what we would call unsafe medications. So a generic is above the table, it's regulated, it's allowable by the FDA in the US. There are unsafe medications that are not generics. These are medicines that are considered counterfeit, so they're made without a license. They're made without regulation of the FDA. And then there are substandard medicines. Substandard medicines are even worse than counterfeit. They could be, there could be less of the original medication in the substandard medication. It may not be exactly the right structure. It could be diluted some. So it's, it, these two don't have the quality regulation that the true generics have. A true generic is regulated to some degree. It's, it's regulated fairly closely. The problem, as I'll mention a little bit, is the generics are not compared head to head, so you don't really know. But put that in the context of counterfeit and substandard. Generics are neither counterfeit nor substandard. They're legal and they're above the table. So what are the challenges we face with generics? So this is the questions that we often ask. What are the benefits and risks of generics? Well, the benefit is that it'll lower the cost for many patients, not all patients, and it will allow some patients who couldn't afford a medication like a matinib or a branded medicine, they couldn't afford the brand, but with the availability of a generic, they may, need, may now be able to afford a therapy that they need. It may increase adherence. Some patients have to pay so much for a branded medicine that they don't take the full dose or they skip days to make it last longer. Or they do things like taking grapefruit juice or star fruit to try to increase the levels when they take lower medicine, which is risky because we don't know the bioavailability. So, so those are some of the challenges. Generics also lead to considerable cost savings. It's not important to some people, it is important to others. It's certainly, in the long-term view of our country, it's in our Medicare, it's an issue. But for an individual patient, it may or may not be an issue. It's also, um, you know, there's also the big question. 
using a generic, is it the same efficacy? Is it the same safety? Is it the same quality of a generic as the branded form? And that's a question that we don't know the answer because they've not been compared head to head in clinical trials. That's not the way the, the FDA approaches generics. So here's two studies looking at generic imatinib and CML. This hasn't been done in GIST, but this has been published in CML in the same journals, you'll notice. So these are the same medical journals. One journal found that in one study, generic imatinib was identical and effective, just as effective as branded imatinib. The other study found that the non-branded version of imatinib was not quite as effective as the branded version. So even in CML, two studies disagree with each other. Is this the same generic? No. Yeah. No, no, this was just a group of South American, South Amer largely South American generics, which some of these may have been counterfeit, some of these may have even been substandard medications. So, unfortunately, the available data on generic is really limited. We generally have to take a pragmatic approach to what's happening. There are no really randomized trials comparing branded and unbranded. The generic products may not have uniform production standards, but they may come from multiple manufacturers. There may be some difference in the filler. Patients can have adverse reactions due to the filler. Some fillers are lactose-based. Some patients are lactose intolerant. And so fillers can also cause different side effects, even if the medication is exactly the same. At the end of the day, we don't know whether or not generics are exactly identical in terms of safety and efficacy as a branded medicine. They're the same compound. They're the same structure. They should be the same, but we can't definitively say that they are just because we don't have that, have that data. So I'll say a few words about research. Another one of our core missions for just, our GIST patients here at Sylvester. Research is, uh, takes a lot of forms. There is a type of research that we don't talk about much in GIST because there's so few of us doing research and there's so much research to do, disparity research. There's patients out there with GIST that don't have internet access. They may not have mobile phones. How do they find out about the GIST day of learning? They, don't, they can't email, they don't go to blogs, they don't tweet or whatever kids are doing these days. They, um, you know, there's, there's, I guarantee you thousands of patients out there that don't have access to this information, may not even have access to healthcare in the US. Worse, probably in other countries. Population-based research looking at SEER and Medicare databases to look at outcomes of different populations. African American compared to Caucasian, compared to Latino. Uh, but again, there's still very little, very little information out there because it's a rare disease and, and because it's, uh, it's underfunded in terms of, of clinical research dollars, population-based research dollars. And there aren't experts in population-based research studying just Largely they look at breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, the common types of cancer. But it's an area where we need to better understand what's happening to, to just patients. And then of course the thing we talk about constantly and have talked about today already, patient-oriented research such as clinical trials, laboratory and translational or preclinical research as well. I'm not going to say any more about the first two because there's really not too much, not too much to say. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, one of our new initiatives uh, that uh, Dr. Wilkie is lead at our sarcoma center, and that's incorporating immunotherapy into the care for GIST and other sarcoma patients. There's a new, um, so the immune system, its job is to fight infections, to fight foreign things in the body. So if you remember a GIST cell, just cells have mutations in the kit gene, often mutations in other genes 
these lead to proteins that are different than the normal protein in the body. So a kit mutant just has a different structure, a diff can have a different shape than the normal kit in the body. So how does, so yet at the same time, the GIST cells in a patient's body hide from the immune system. How do they do this? They do this through, um, through a number of different ways. The, the normal, normally what happens when somebody gets a foreign antigen in the body, such as the flu, an antigen presenting cell, such as a dendritic cell, I'll discuss in a little bit, grabs onto this foreign protein and shows it to the immune system. And so the immune system says, hey, this is not normal. So the immune cells react and get activated and attack the flu or the virus infected cell. In the normal cell, there is a checkpoint that tells the immune system, hey, I'm a normal cell. So you can see in the cartoon here, don't eat me. <laughs> courtesy of Dr. Wilkie. This isn't my slide. So, so then with the situation of the tumor cell, such as a GIST, again the antigen presenting cell shows the tumor cell's antigen, the protein, the mutant protein in the tumor, to the immune system, activates the immune system. The immune system goes to eat the tumor cell, but what happens, we think, is that there is this molecule called PDL1 that tells the T cell or the immune system, tricks it and says this is a normal cell. Again, don't eat me. So, uh, so one of the clinical trials I'll show you in a second is involving a medication called a checkpoint inhibitor. And the checkpoint inhibitor, it prevents this PD1 from binding to PDL1. So then the activated immune cell, the T cell, then recognizes the tumor cell as something that's foreign, something that shouldn't be there. And the immune system is, is able to now attack and kill the GIST cells based on the presentation of this antigen and the activation of the T cells. So here's the first of, of Dr. Wilkie's trials, dendritic cell vaccine protocol. So in this, pre, in this protocol, patients with, with a GIST would have their tumor resected, or other sarcoma, it's open to all sarcomas, would have their GIST resected, would have the tumor frozen and broken down into proteins, will have these, ha, ha, then the patient would also have dendritic cells, or these antigen presenting cells taken from their blood, grown up in culture, and then the antigen presenting cells get loaded with the antigens. So this is the antigen presenting cell. So in the laboratory, you put the antigen onto the, anti the GIST antigen or the sarcoma cell antigen onto the tumor cell, and then grow these up in tissue culture. They can be activated in a number of different ways in vitro to develop a mature dendritic cell that's ready to activate the T cell. And then these dendritic cells get injected back into the patient and the patient undergoes vaccinations to continually activate the dendritic cells so that they continue to present to the T cells and the T cells continue to get activated. And when you have activated dendritic cells presenting antigen and you have activated T cells, you hope to get this situation where the T cell then attacks the tumor cell. And on this protocol, we've treated nine patients so far. And some of the patients, three of them, have done exceptionally well and are still without recurrence of their sarcoma to date. The second immunotherapy trial, available for GIST patients, other sarcoma patients as well, this trial uses the checkpoint inhibitor that I discussed that removes the camouflage from the tumor cell so that the immune system can attack it, but in combination with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor called excitinib. Excitinib is important because it inhibits KIT. So it can inhibit KIT and it can kill just cells 
by virtue of shutting off kit signaling and when the cells die they should release these antigens or mutant tumor proteins such that a dendritic cell or other antigen producing cell can present them to a T cell and then the T cell can attack the tumor cell that now has had the camouflage removed by treatment with um, this medication called pembrolizumab. Pembrolizumab it was one of those PDL1 inhibitors that removes the camouflage from the tumor cell so that the immune system can activate it. And, and so this type of trial makes a lot of sense for just patients. So this is just a list of our clinical trials at Sylvester that are available for, for GIST patients. We have a notch inhibitor trial that's open, a notch inhibitor trial that's planned. It's not open yet, but planned. This Plexicon trial uses two different kit inhibitors. One that acts at secondary mutations in exon 13, one that acts at secondary mutations in exon 17. This is open. We have the, as I mentioned, Exitinib plus Pembrolizumab, which should be opening soon, not quite ready to go yet. Dendritic cell vaccine trial is open at our site. There's an AKT inhibitor phase one trial, an Aurora kinase inhibitor trial that requires some degree of, of uh, liver involvement, liver abnormalities. Um, we're working with SARC to open this trial. Again, this trial is not open yet, but we're planning on opening a KIT inhibitor plus a MEK inhibitor. And as uh, we have frontline trial, mesitinib versus imatinib, and we have second line GIST trial, mesitinib versus sunitinib. Okay, so we'll wind down by discussing some of the things that we're studying in the GIST laboratory. And so we're interested in optimizing the ability of imatinib and other kit inhibitors to kill GIST cells. If you take GIST cells out of a patient, grow them in culture, treat them with imatinib, you don't kill all of the GIST cells with imatinib. In patients, we know often we don't kill all of the GIST cells. Our goal is to kill all of the GIST cells. Imatinib is the first step, but we know that it's not complete. We know that imatinib can block signaling, can result in apoptosis and eradication, but we also know that imatinib uh, is prone to resistance and continued disease progression. So um, our post, one of our postdocs is working on better understanding this pathway so that, so that we can optimize apoptosis. Apoptosis means just cell death. Okay, so in GIST, it requires activating the machinery that's within, and then there's another mechanism of resistance called autophagy. So there's a protein in GIST cells, about 80% of GIST cells have a protein called BCL2 that's overexpressed. A, a fellow who's now faculty at MD Anderson working with me showed that, eight, that, that this is very common in GIST, 80% overexpression of BCL2. BCL2 blocks apoptosis, blocks cell death. So it's impairing the ability of imatinib to kill all of the GIST cells 80% of the, in 80% of patients. BIM, I'll skip down, BIM is a protein, it's a mediator of imatinib-induced apoptosis. So BIM allows apoptosis by binding BCL2. So this is what we think happens. GIST cells are treated with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And if, uh, if BIM activation is present, BCL2 is bound and sequestered away and apoptosis is allowed to take place. If BIM if BCL2 is not inhibited and sequestered, some tumor cells survive. There's a medication recently approved called abatoclax, uh, similar to ABT737, that sequesters all of these proteins away from the apoptotic machinery such that cell death can take place. So we looked in vitro at cell, the, num the GIST cells. So the green dots are GIST cells. 
just cells. These are two of the commonly used cell lines. And uh, you'll notice that, oh, that didn't come through, but I'll walk you through this. So, so this is, oh yeah, it did, here it is. This is untreated, just cells. So there's 20 or 30 or so just cells there. When these cells are treated with the matinib, there's been a reduction in just cells, right? It's gone down some, but there's still a lot of just cells. When we use a pro this obatoclax, ABT, pr that promotes apoptosis, you see a pretty steep reduction in just cells, but you still see a few. When you combine a relatively low dose of matinib with ABT, you're down to one just cell. So that's exceptionally more effective than using a matinib alone in both of these cell lines. Orange represents apoptotic cells. By this point, most cells are gone, although the ones that are left are apoptotic. So this is an important cell line. Just 48, just Sarah probably recognizes this from the life raft group um, and they're the, uh, the, the uh, research team at LifeRaft Group who loaned me these cells, just 48 IM, is imatinib resistant. So surprisingly, this cell line is resistant to imatinib, yet when you treat with ABT alone, and with ABT plus imatinib, you're able to reverse the resistance to imatinib and kill just cells. We did a very, very rigorous statistical analysis and proved that not only does the ABT drug and imatinib work together, it's not additive, it's synergistic. It's be it works better than either one alone if you were to add them together. The sum of the two is great, it's the, the total is greater than the sum of the two. So we're looking and hoping to use that medicine in combination with imatinib in the future for our GIST patients. And I'll just end by bringing up again, how do we cure GIST? There's not gonna be a simple cure. It's going to be a combination of approaches. It's going to be a lot of work by a lot of people in a lot of different fields. We've made a lot of progress, but there's still a long way to go, and it's going to involve not just new medications, not just laboratory research, but it's going to involve education, oncologists, patients, caregivers, nurses. It's going to involve understanding what causes just in the first place. What causes kit mutation? It would help if we could figure that out. Improving patient care. There's still a lot of things that we can do in terms of clinical trials, in terms of thinking outside the box and publishing our observations, in terms of improving patient care across the country. And there's a lot of research to do in clinical trials, but also there's lots of, lots of laboratory research to do, which even today, as important as just is as a disease and as important it is to all of us, is still underfunded. We don't get, it's very hard for us in our laboratory to get uh, financial support to do these types of experiments and these types of clinical trials from, from federal government, from, from foundations. It's very difficult to fund, but, but we keep uh, doing as much as we can as fast as we can. But really an important part of curing GIST is the team. And again, I can't emphasize enough for caring for your GIST patients, go to a multidisciplinary center. Make sure if you hear of anybody diagnosed with GIST that they get to a GIST center of excellence um, that has, uh, has a, a robust, well-rounded team. And, and everything we've talked about today would not be possible without this team. So it's a critical part of our success. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I know somebody's got a question on generic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just curious about the ABT pre 737. Yeah. Is that a similar drug to the uh, No, it's completely different. 
Yeah, it, we think that it will help a matinib work better by removing some of the resistance. But we're, you know, it's the kind of thing that has to be tested in a clinical trial. And the, and the company that owns the medication has been resistant to testing it in GIST until we're able to prove what, we've, what I just showed you, we have to prove in an animal model. So we're applying for funding through a couple of foundations to be able to have the personnel and to have the animals to be able to test this combination to prove that not only does it work in the laboratory, but it also works in a m mammalian system. And then if we can prove that, they seem to be hinting they will give us the medication for a clinical trial. Yeah? What's the process for making yourself available to a clinical trial? How does someone participate? Yeah, it just depends on the clinical trial. So there's all types of clinical trials. Clinical trials sometimes involve surgery, sometimes radiation, sometimes a therapy like the ones we've shown you. Um, so it just depends on the trial. The majority of the trials that we have right now for GIST patients require patients to have a GIST in their body that's growing. Okay? So, so if we have that, if we have that and we can measure it, and then we can identify which trial makes sense for, for which patient. And that depends on what prior medicines you've had, among other, among other things. Sometimes the molecular results of the analysis. Okay? What's yep. The, what's the timeline usually? Whenever you say, you know, you've got something that's in the works and say it's a clinical trial in phase one, what's usually the timeline for getting that to, uh, I don't know, where it's FDA approved? Um, you know, that can often take five years or longer from phase one to FDA approval. So it's a long process. Even with good drugs, it can take 10 years. Yeah, it's, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult. It, you know, it's being done. It's being done in places around the country for breast cancer, for prostate cancer, for cervical cancer in high-risk populations. And, you know, there's pockets around the country where inter internet access is, is, prob is very, very low. And so what some individuals do is they go directly to the community. Like we have a program here that goes to um, indigent areas. It goes to churches, meets with people after church, and goes to community centers, goes to schools, and tries to you know get information about awareness. But we don't have that for just. We have it for the common cancers. So those are some of the things that can be done. It's it's you know it's. It's um, billboards, posters, right. flyers. Sometimes you have to be have feet on the ground, and it's difficult in a rare disease. With so little information, I mean, I know just your healthcare physicians, you know, just going to your primary care physician, and they don't have the knowledge to help treat somebody like us. So, yeah. I mean, that's it, I, it just makes me like a hugely compounded problem if those patients are going to their primary care physician in, in these other cities yeah. where there is absolutely no information and, and no real good way to get help. Yeah. I'm just wondering how they, I think, or even identify. Yeah. Sarah wanted to say something. Yeah. 
go to these community cancer centers and see if they can have these pamphlets on hand to distribute to the patients and then if they come find the life breath group we can make sure patients are, are getting the right information and being triaged to a center that knows how to treat this disease. So, um, so we sort of need some boots on the ground to help us with that. And so if, you know, if there are community cancer centers near you that you're willing to you know, hand some brochures out, I think that's, that's helpful because you can at least identify more patients that way and get the, the right information. I think information. probably I'll, I'm going to probably all come from a lot of different areas coming out here. And I'm sure we all each have an individual story. Yeah. And I'm waiting to come. that information and I'm just wondering if there's anything, you know, if we signed up for something today to get information from you, you didn't have it in our areas? Yeah, so just we have, that we have, uh, so we have those materials that we gave you and there's some ideas on how you can participate in just awareness day and then you can reach back out to us and we can give you materials for you to distribute. Um, we have your information, your contact information since you registered today, so you'll be getting some information about how you can, you know, learn more about some of our, our activities and our campaigns going forward and see if there's anything that piques your interest and see how you can participate. I mean, I know that we put on this big just day of learning, but we're a small organization and we really need your help because there are not many, like, not many just patients meet one another. I mean, this is very unique that you have the center so close by and this amazing, excellent team at your fingertips not many people have that, so we need all of your help to, to carry this forward. And when I first was diagnosed, um, the very first thing that my daughter said to me was, we could have died and we would have never known who you died from. We could have just died. And that's very true. And that could be very true for folks that aren't getting the right kind of health care. Well, a lot of people did. Yes. Just so that the people who are working on this here and through LifeRap know, uh, our school has a program called Future Problem Solvers, and a component of that is community, CMPS, community problem solvers, and those children took on telling people about a teacher. Okay. It's so people from schools all over this state had children who got to hear for the first time what gas, and these children can say it, gastrointestinal stromal tumors are. So they really did a good job. And they made people cry. <laughs> uh, they made a lot of people cry, not just spouses. What's the school? The school was Barry, Illinois. Uh, Barry Elementary in Barry, Florida, which is between um, DeBerry, DeBerry, be between Daytona and Orlando. Um, it is an elementary, but those children have no yes. fear that anything can't be beat. So they were perfect to say, if you learn about this, if you help people to know about this, they can get cured because they have absolute faith in technology and what can happen in the future. I think it's important to share your story. Just like you know, we heard these wonderful inspiring stories today, share it with your local media. Share, like, like let people understand like what just did. I mean, Dr. Trent, he's participated in some of the local media channels, and some national uh, media talking about just, but we just got to keep doing more so that patients aren't being misdiagnosed and they're going to the right physicians. That as a result of the, these students doing their work and bringing awareness about this and, and other cancers, um, they're going to be spotlighted in our local media as well. So it should bring more Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for doing, you know, helping. Thank you for organizing this event today. Okay, thank you guys for coming.